morning. Great to see you guys for our brand new series in Jonah. Uh, you know, I, I got to sing a song for you. I want you to shout out the name of the TV show if you recognize it, but I hate doing it after being in such an awesome presence of the Lord. You know what I mean? In worship, because when I sing this next song, it is going to be like a total gear shift. <laughs> Are you ready? Shout it out if you recognize it. What TV show do you think of? Bad boys, bad boys, or what you gonna do? What, there you go. You got it, right? Cops. If you haven't seen the show, <laughs> relax. You're not missing much. It ran for 32 seasons, and it got canceled, but it just got picked back up, I think by Fox, for a 33rd season. Can you imagine that? 33 seasons of mayhem. If you're not familiar with what happens in this show, police run around and they chase uh, alleged criminals and, and people who are doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing, whether it's drugs or you name it. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And there's a camera crew that follows them. And usually what happens is some kind of almost funny high-speed chase that ends up being like a low-speed chase that ends up being like, almost like, like a walker, you know? And it's, just, it's some of the, the most bizarre stuff. It is, it is one of the most telling uh, ways that you can look at our culture and see one truth, and that is this. People are running away because they don't want to get caught. Or, if we're being really honest, maybe a better way to say it is they don't want to face the consequences of getting caught, the consequences of their actions. There's a lot of people who live their whole lives like that, running from God, because the same way a fugitive runs from the police, they feel like God is standing there out to get them. Like he's just sitting, you know, bad boy, bad boy, just boom, and just going to slam somebody. You know, like little bunny foo-foo, bop them on the head. That's not God. That is, when I look at this, I think this is a perfect opener for Jonah because we all know people who don't want anything to do with God. They don't want to hear his word. They don't want to go to church. They don't want, just the less I have to think about God, the better. I want nothing to do with them. Others may actually know God, but yet they still want to run from his plan. That's Jonah. It is so crazy when you think about this. All of us at one time or another have probably run from God. You may know people who at one time were on fire for the Lord. Man, they were serving, they were teaching, they were playing, they were doing child care, which is like double bonus for the Lord. And then something happened. They just started to run. Maybe it was because God was calling them to live his purpose instead of their own. And for honest today, I think we're going to identify with Jonah a little bit more then we went to. As I was walking in, Pastor Bill stopped me. He goes, man, I'm excited about Jonah. He goes, let's be honest. They're like, we could finish each other's sentences, right? You know, finish each other's sandwiches. He was like, we all run from God. I'm like, yes, that's the title of today. We all do this. So over the next four weeks, maybe five, we're going to go verse by verse through Jonah. It is going to be so stinking awesome. I hope you're ready. Go ahead and find it in your Bible. It's in the Old Testament, kind of towards the back of the Old Testament, not far from the end. While you get that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us. And if you're a first-time guest, special welcome. Thanks for being here. We have new people every single week, and you make our services better. We're glad to have you, and I hope you stop by the lobby on the way out. We have a gift for you. As I was studying this, uh, I came across Dr. Barry Davis, who did an extensive study on Jonah. And I'm going to be referencing him often during this series. And he writes this. He says, one of the questions we have to ask anytime you examine Jonah is this. Can running from God really be justified? Or, to put it a different way, the big question is this. Why would a person run from God in the first place? I mean, we think about it logically. We go, Pastor, I'm not going to run from God. That's crazy. God wants what's best for us. Why would I do that? Oh, contraire. We all do from time to time. We're going to list some examples in just a minute and go, ooh, man, I never thought about that as running from God. But we all do it. I think we all can identify with it. All right, so look with me. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read from the NLT to start with today. It says this, The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how awesome its people are. Oh, no, you're supposed to say that? What's your word? Does it say wicked? Mine says wicked. See how wicked its people are. And before we go pointing at them and saying, those wicked Ninevites, 
let's just look in our own backyard. We're not here to cast any judgments. God's word does the judging for us. And we look at, it's a mirror, and we're going to look at this. Jonah clearly heard God's voice. There's no mistake in it. It is right there. There is no getting around it. Jonah wasn't hallucinating. It wasn't heartburn. He wasn't intoxicated. He wasn't smoking the wacky weed. He wasn't puffing the magic dragon or whatever kids call it today. He was in his right mind, and he heard clearly the message from the Lord. But I want you to notice what Jonah did the minute he heard God's voice. He ran. He ran. The moment he heard it was God speaking to us, verse 1 tells us he took off. And there it is. You know when God's speaking to you. We know when God is asking us to do something. We know if we're walking in obedience, and we know if we are walking in disobedience, don't we? If you have the Holy Spirit, come on. Oh, it's awful lonely up here today. Come on. We know this. When the, when the Bible says God spoke, it is so clear. We see this time and time again. Pastor Jason referenced it last week, Adam and Eve in the garden. Once they sinned, that fellowship was broken. God comes down, enters, enters the scene, walks through the garden and says, Adam, where are you at? Where are you? God knew where they were. You know what they were doing? They were hiding. They were hiding from God's holiness, from his righteousness. We see this time and time again. In Exodus 19, Moses clearly heard God calling him up to the top of the mountain. Moses, I got something for you. Judges 2. The Israelites clearly heard God chastising them for their disobedience, and they wept as a result. Let me just pause there. When is the last time we wept for our sin? Was it ever? We see this even in the New Testament. Anytime Jesus speaks, he is clear. He is unmistakable. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah, he said, whoa, it's me. When God revealed himself, I am undone. He was a prophet. He said, I am undone. In fact, I am, a, I'm a, I am unclean. And I dwell among the people who are unclean. They unmistakably heard God's voice. So why was Jonah different? When Jonah heard the word of the Lord, he ran as fast as his little stubby legs could carry him in the opposite direction. That's the first thing we see Jonah doing. He is running from God's voice. Now here's the deal, guys. I'm just going to be honest. This is the kind of response we expect from a lost world. This is the kind of response we expect from someone who doesn't claim to know Jesus. But that's not Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. He was the man. He was on the good side. He knew better. He was what, y'all, this gives me so much hope. Anytime we are willfully disobeying God and say, well, at least Jonah did it, right? It's so easy to point that blame. Think about this. He was a prophet of God. Can you remember before you knew the Lord? Can you remember when, when you were lost? You were living for yourself. You didn't really have any direction. You remember how it felt when you were running from God, and yet you came just close enough to the Holy Spirit that that conviction started to tug and make you just a little uncomfortable. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe the pastor would say, hey, you need to come down here and talk to the Lord, like you're gripping that chair in front of you so tight that your knuckles are white. Got a little bead of sweat coming. That's how I was. 16 years old, man, Ridgecrest, North Carolina. He's like, he's sharing the truth. I'm like, I've never heard this, but oh, man, this is killing me. The best night of my life. You remember that? You remember when the Holy Spirit came and convicted us? Do we like that? Isn't our natural instinct, be honest, to run? When that bright, heavenly spotlight comes down on our head, it's like, oh, we're standing there. Oh, I feel so exposed right now. Nobody likes it. The, the Bible is a mirror. When you read it, it shows us for who we are, good and bad. And the bad is good because we need to know that. Don't we want to be more like Christ? So it's a mirror, but nobody likes looking in a mirror up close. You ever, you ever grabbed your smartphone and you get ready to take a picture and the camera's facing you <laughs> instead of the other one, right? This happened to me just this week. This is like <laughs> this is a, this is a selfie right there. Nobody likes that. It's frightening. You want to run, right? And that's exactly what Jonah did. I heard a true story just this week about a parent who was in the... All right, good, Mimi, you can go to something else. That's, that's killer. Thank, thank you. It's awesome. Thank you, Mimi, for running slides. Look at that. Awesome. So we're sitting here. This guy, is, he's, he's washing his dishes in the kitchen sink, and he hears a strange noise outside in his backyard. He's like, none of my kids are out back. They're too small. Some of them are at school. What am I hearing? He looks out the window, 
and he sees some of the older kids, apparently on spring break, have hopped the fence, and they're filling up the little inflatable baby pool, and they're doing wrestling moves. They're like body slam, not wrestling, wrestling, like hardcore, like let's set up tables and jump, and people's elbow, and all this stuff. And he's like, what on earth are they doing? Check this out. He goes to the exit door, the kitchen door of the backyard, opens it up, and all of those older teenagers pew, bolt. <laughs> Why? Because they knew they got caught. But here's the funny thing. If that nice guy would have went up and said, hey, guys, what are you doing? Why would you run? You know what they would say? Uh, it's the first thing that came into my mind. It's what I thought. I don't know. It's gut instinct, right? That's what we do. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, the first thing we do is we recoil instead of saying, God, thank you. Thank you, sir. May I have another? I need that. I want to be more like you. And if there's something in my life that doesn't resemble the Father, you have permission to chisel it off of me. You know, i got to ask, do you give God that permission? I hope you do. I hope I do. Otherwise, we're just kind of going through the motions. And we're not really any different than anyone else. When we run from God, we're denying His voice. I think when we run from God, we confuse the lost world. See, it's understandable for those who don't know Jesus. What about us? I mean, surely that's not us, right? We, we don't ever do that. We're decent, good, church-going people. We don't ever run from God. I think if we're honest, every one of us can acknowledge a time when the Holy Spirit has convicted us to maybe do something, and we don't do it. Or maybe stop doing something, something we shouldn't be doing, and we do it anyway. Isn't that running from God? When God prompts your heart, hey, I, don't, I want you to give to this person. I want you to go serve on that mission trip. I want you to serve in child care. And we say, well, isn't that kind of running from God? I want you to go across the street and tell that neighbor about me. Oh, God, it's a little weird. It's running from God. It's easy to do. Jonah shows us how, how easy. You know, we can walk out the door and ignore it. That's running from God. We have to obey that conviction. Here's why we don't. Conviction is always painful. Conviction is always painful. You know why? Because it means we have to change. It means there has to be a change in our lives. So you know I got to ask. Let's just pause there. Are you willing to change? Are you willing to give God the blank check, carte blanche, and say, God, write my story. Do whatever it takes. See, in Jonah's case, it meant giving up a lifelong prejudice and a lifelong hatred toward those wascally Ninevites. People who were different from him. They looked different. They earned a different living than him. They had a different reputation. God help us if we ever look down on anyone because they look different, because they come from a different side of the tracks, because they do a different kind of work, because they dress differently. That has no place in God's family. Jonah was in danger of losing God's favor because his hate did not go hand in hand with God's love. It was incompatible. God knew it. See, there had to be a change. Well, guess what? Who's going to change? Is it going to be God? <laughs> is he going to redefine his character? Or is it going to be Jonah? Who needs to change? It's Jonah. Jonah has to change, but change is so hard, Pastor, it's painful. If we're honest, most Christians, we're just like Jonah. We find it so much easier to run from that conviction when the Holy Spirit comes and says, hey, I need you to do something different. We don't allow him to make that change, even though it's better. Have you ever noticed that? Don't miss the first truth here. Whether you're a Christian or whether you are a non-Christian, the person who's running from God has heard God's voice. Make no mistake, God speaks loud and clear, but we're running from his voice. The next thing we see Jonah doing is he's running from God's plan. Mm -mm -mm. Very clearly, we see that the word of the Lord has come to him, and Jonah has no doubt as to what God wants him to do. But I want you to check out what Jonah does in verse 3. Read with me. He says, but Jonah got up and he went in the opposite direction to get away from God. Can you believe this? Who would do that? Oh, wait, that's right. That's us too. I want to pause here because as I was studying this week, I learned something so awesome. As I was preparing this meal for us to eat today, I looked into the Hebrew. 
And there was this one word, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth word in that sentence starts with a W, went. Your translation may say flee. If it does, that's actually a great translation because the original Hebrew word used here is barak, barak. It is an incredibly powerful word that does translate as flee, but the, the actual rendering of it conveys the sense of you are fleeing for your life. You are fleeing in great fear, as if a gazelle has been caught in a thicket and a hunter's coming behind him and he's trying to, to get out of the thicket and she literally has to jump through the woods, through the thorns, through the bush, through the shrub, through the thorns and flee for their life. And I think of the energy and the intensity of that. That's what Jonah was doing. And as I shared that, my family was in my office. I looked at Amy. I said, Amy, do you know what this reminds me of? This word, barak? It reminds me of when I was 20, maybe 20 years old, and I was going to a haunted house. You ever been to one of those haunted houses that the JCs do or the Lions Club, and they raise money for like the, the children's hospital or something, you know? I was going to this haunted house by myself. And there was tons of little nards all around. These kids were everywhere. And I was like, well, how bad could it be? These little kids are in, where's their parents, by the way, right? So I'm sitting here passing all kinds of judgment. And I'm going, this house is massive, multi-story. And I'm walking through, and I'm like, this is, this is easy. I mean, some of these kids are screaming. You can go into all these rooms, and all the hallways are super dark. Get up to the third floor. I'm looking out windows. We're going into these rooms. And then I notice the hallway gets darker towards the end. And I freeze. I look at the end of this hallway. Y'all remember this scene right here where Jamie Lee Curtis thinks the bad guy has been defeated? But as your eyes adjust to the dark, you actually realize the bad guy is right there. And you see that glowing white face? That's the face I saw at the end of this hallway. And as I'm looking, I said, none of these kids know the danger they're in. That's Michael Myers. He's the worst. And I'm staring, I'm like, wait a minute. That dude's like six foot eight. There's no way that's a real person. That's a mannequin. So as I got brave, I took another step. I'm like, okay, it's a mannequin. It's a, all these other rooms had mannequins, a couple live actors. And I get closer, and there's all these kids going in and out of rooms, and my eyes are adjusting. I'm looking. I'm like, he sure looks real. <laughs> and just as I'm about to get my confidence up again, his head turns and looks at me. Y'all? <laughs> I was gone. <laughs> I ran so fast. I just had one problem. I had kids all around me. So now I had a problem. You see where I'm going with this? This was my thicket. These kids were not going to stop me from getting attacked by Michael Myers. And as he slowly walked towards me, I had to take these kids. I was <laughs> flinging out of the yard. Michael Myers can have them. I was... I was I was barocking these kids, right? I had to get the barack out of there. I was literally flinging him around. That's what Jonah was doing. Now do you see the intensity of what Jonah was fleeing with? He was fleeing God thinking, if I obey God, I am going to die. Those Ninevites will kill me. He had to barack. He was fleeing away from what he thought was certain death. He was about to miss God's will doing it, okay? So notice the intensity of what Jonah was doing. Now, keep reading. Look at verse 3 and go on. But Jonah got up. He went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket. He went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. I want you to notice how that verse begins with the word but. But is a conjunction. As you, anybody remember uh, Schoolhouse Rock, right? <laughs> Did you sing it? You know it. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking on some, yeah, yeah, right, that one, right? <laughs> you don't know it any better than I do. That's what I think of. It is a conjunction. Dr. Davis literally calls this word the conjunction of contrast. I love that. It is a contrast of what is happening because God said, go to Nineveh, but Jonah does something else. Do you catch that? He would do something. How many times does Jesus say, hey, I want you to go do this. Go for me. Speak for me. Will you be my hands and my, my feet? Will you deliver my message? Maybe you've got the feeling that God is prompting you to do something. But you're saying, but. 
Or maybe God has prompted you to go somewhere, but you ignore it. You just busy yourself doing other things. Maybe it's time that he's wanting you to step out in faith. Take that step to do something greater for him. Maybe he's asked you to serve somewhere, to teach a class, mentor the next generation. Maybe surrender to the ministry. Maybe plant a new church. Maybe do local missions. Maybe he's calling you to step up and help teach kids right here in our community. I am so excited to share breaking news with you. For the first time in years, we are able to do a VBS this summer. This is going to be so awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome. But it doesn't happen alone. Oh, you're going to stop clapping there. <laughs> Every one of you who clapped, sign up. How about that? Okay? These things don't just happen. It is going to be a chance to pour into the lives of these kids. We haven't been able to do one in years. COVID notwithstanding, even prior to that, everybody said, all the extras, hey, nobody's doing that. You got to call it summer camp. got to do this. Nobody's interested. The kids got too many things, too many distractions. Guys, we still got to hold out the truth. We still got to set the table. We'll just trust that parents and the Lord and people are going to bring the kids to the meal. Maybe God's calling you to step up. Maybe you can't do it every day of the week. Maybe you can do it just one night. Come see Marin after church and tell her you want to help, okay? She's right here on the front row. Come on, she's the one enthusiastically waving both hands. Come to her. Amen. These things don't just happen by themselves. We're taking a step of faith. Maybe God's calling you to minister in your own backyard, local mission. Maybe it's going on mission overseas for him. In just a few minutes, Pastor Bill is going to come up, and he's going to share a few things that you can help with today to bless and move missions forward. See, he says, go to Nineveh, Jonah. But God, and we see something similar happen with Jesus. This isn't just an Old Testament thing. Jesus had this guy come up to him. We know him as the rich young ruler. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, ah, keep the commandments. And the rich young ruler says, sweet, I've been doing that my whole life. And he goes to walk away, and Jesus goes, oh, wait, 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 wait. There is one more thing. Yes. Sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And that rich young ruler's face fell. And it says he went away sad because he had great wealth. I'm committed, Jesus, but I'm almost fully surrendered, Lord. But, oh, I would, I would, I would serve, I would do that. But, see what we're doing here? We're saying the word but. It is that, that red flag that we're about to cancel what God is saying to our heart. Anybody ever seen a billy goat headbutt something? <laughs> it is hilarious. There is this true picture. This is in Brazil. There is a billy goat that is on the loose. I don't know how far away, but I just Google billy goat. And this came up. And he goes on and on. There's another one where he is chasing the locals through town. Anytime you get near this particular building, until they could get him corralled, he was headbutting anyone who came near him. In fact, it didn't matter if you were on a motorcycle, <laughs> in a car, he was crazy. He was headbutting everything. And then he finally got a victim. And once he knocked you down, he stood over you like the devil and said, You are my trophy. I have headbutted you and I have won. We might call people who run from God billy goat Christians because they're always butting God. They're always saying, I would, God, but oh, I got that game. I would, God, but you know, I'm busy. God, I, I would, you know what's so tragic about this is we are running from God's plan. We're running from the good part of God. We're running, he has the best life waiting for us, and we come and bring our plans, and he's like, oh, child. Really? That's your, that's your big dream for your life? You're playing in the kiddie pool. And God says, turn around. I've got this ocean. Sometimes I think we, we miss God's plan because we, we butt him. And we miss out on the vast ocean he has. What if we get before the Lord and we find the tables are turned? And he comes up and he says, oh, welcome, man, your plans. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right, God? Let me show you what I had planned for you, but let me show you what I was going to do in your life, 
but you had your own ideas. See how Jonah relates to today? Do you see how applicable this is? I think if we would remove this word, this contraction, this, this, this contrasting conjunction, we would see God's will open up in our life like never before. Look at verse 3 again. I want you to notice the word after that. It says, but Jonah. You know what that means? It means it's Jonah's responsibility here. Make no mistake, no one made the decision but Jonah alone to run. No one else. Okay, so unpopular truth alert. Okay, get your stone ready to throw at me. If you choose to reject God's will for your life, you alone are responsible for that. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he is not going to force you. You have a free will. You can headbutt God, the creator, and say, I appreciate it, but I think I know better. And you say, Pastor, I would never say that. Come on. It's just us. It's just family. We say that with our actions all the time. I would, God, but don't be like Jonah. Not in this, this instance right here. Don't rise up and flee. Surrender to the Lord. Every one of us has a place where we go where we think we can escape God. Jonas was Tarshish. What's your Tarshish? We all have our personal Tarshish, a place where we go, we, you know, we try to hide when God's calling us to do something. We hear his voice, we read his word, we're like, I'm just going to close that part, put that in the freezer. I'll come back to that later. You think, well, Pastor, I don't do really anything like that. I don't, I don't have a Tarshish. Can I ask a very uncomfortable question? Where do you go to escape doing what God's asked you to do? Doesn't have to be some Tarshish. Doesn't have to be some sketchy biker bar or some strip club. It could be a golf course. It could be a movie theater. It could be a tennis court. It could be pickleball. It could be the lake. Not one of those things is bad in and of itself. Well, those first two I mentioned are bad. Don't do those. But none of those other examples are bad. Pastor Bats, Curtis, go to a strip club. Woo. No. It's bad. It's bad. All those other things come in the guise of innocent fun. And there's nothing wrong with those unless we are running to those to busy ourselves to get away from doing what God's called us to do. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference here? We busy ourselves simply so that we don't have to acknowledge the Lord wanting us to do something. So let me ask another hard question. Are the things in your life that you busy yourself with for the sole purpose of getting out of what God's asked you to do? Just do an inventory. Be honest. Just you. Don't say it out loud. Are there times in your life when you'd rather just not hear from God? Sure. I've been there. What do we do about it? See, when I was growing up, I was often left behind because I was the youngest. <laughs> and the youngest get left behind. You know, true confession, I went to Kohl's when our youngest was very young. One of the few times I had the car seat. Wasn't used to it. Pulling to Beaver Creek. Some of you know where this is going. <laughs> Pulling to Beaver Creek. Sorry, babe. I think I told you this. I hope I did. If not, <laughs> confession's good for the soul. <laughs> Locked the car. Bebop into Coles, getting picked something up. And I'm like, I mean, I feel like I'm forgetting something. I really feel like, oh, my kid. <laughs> I run back out. She's sitting there, you know, drooling. She didn't care. But you know, I was just like, man, this could have been horrible. It was cold out. Thankfully, it wasn't like, you know, but like, it's the youngest. We often kind of forget to include the youngest in our plans. And I wonder, do we treat God like the youngest child sometimes? Forget to include him in our plans? Guys, there's no escaping from God. The psalmist very clearly says this. Look at the Psalm 139. He says this. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. No one can ever escape from God or his presence by running. And that's the last thing we see Jonah doing here, running from God's presence. 
running from God's presence. Now, as I read this next verse, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice very closely something you probably have missed, because I missed it too. Notice what Jonah has to do before the running can begin, all right? Look with me, reading, starting in verse 3. He says, but Jonah got up, he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship, leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tashi Station. All right, did you catch that? Oh, Tarshish, right? Did you catch this? Notice something that most of us missed. When Jonah entered the ship, he first had to pay a price. When Jonah entered the ship, he had to pay a fare in order to get a ride. I'm going to tell you something. Satan does not want you to know that. He doesn't want you to know that there is a cost associated when you but God. He does not want you to count the cost on this. There is a price to pay when we run our own direction, when we ignore what God has asked us to do. There is a toll that you will have to pay. Beware. You can run from God. Let's just be honest. You can run from God, but it will always cost you more than you think. There's always a toll that you have to pay when you run from God. You can call it the devil's toll booth if you want. Don't you love tolls? Aren't they fun? Breaking your momentum, doing 70. We're really like, I don't have any coins. Do we have, do I have a credit card? Do I have mark of the beast? What do I do? There's something I got to pay, right? Nobody like, you remember being a kid and your teacher assigned the phantom toll booth? Love this story. You got, you got Milo and the dog, and I didn't name my son after that, but this is, this is what I think of, the toll booth, right in the middle of your road, and you're about to make a decision at this fork. You can obey what God's asked you to do, and you know what God's calling you to do, or you can go your own way and pay Satan's toll. Sounds like a bad horror movie in the 80s, doesn't it? Satan's toll. It's what we think of. Right? we got to pay the toll. Look at what Jonah did. Y'all, he had to pay a lot more than that measly fare to get on the boat. He had to pay more than just a tiny toll. He continued to pay. You know he did. He paid with a guilty conscience. God, you asked me to do something. I didn't do it. I know I'm out of your will. I'm running for You know exactly. Some of you are smiling because you know when you've done that, you've run from God, you feel that separation from him, that cloud comes between you. He doesn't disown you, but your fellowship's a little hindered. Like a cloud's come between you and the sun. He had a guilty conscience. You know he did. He also probably paid for a lack of self-respect. Who am I? Are you kidding me? Man, I'm a prophet. I'm a loser. I eat worms. I'm terrible. I don't have any friends. I smell bad. Hey, whatever the devil's telling you, right? The lies are endless. You know it. He also had to pay dearly with losing a sense of direction for his life. Because now he's on his own. He's going to Tarshish. Next week, I'm going to show you how far Tarshish is from where he was supposed to go over to Nineveh. It is crazy. It's almost laughable. He's paying far more than just Satan's toll. And this is what we do. You know, I just, I ask God, do you really want to headbutt the one who gives you your next breath? We sung about that today. Do we really want to say, God, I appreciate your input noted. Got it. I'm going to file it here. As if it's just a colleague giving us like, hey, some friendly advice. It's the Lord. And he has a plan. The good news is God is still in the U-turn business. And you can make that U-turn. Think, think about how crazy this is to try to be on the run from a God who is all places at all times. Imagine if I'm all freaked out. And I'm hurried and I'm frustrated and I'm bothered. And I go to my favorite travel agent. I go to Tabitha Woodard, right? I come bursting in her office. I'm like, Tabitha, you got to help me. I got to get out of here, man. Book me a trip. I don't care where we're going. Just go. I got to go now. And she's like, okay, all right. When do you want to leave? And Do you have any idea where you want to go? It doesn't matter. I just got to get away from me. I just got to get away from myself. And she's like, what? <laughs> you know how ridiculous that would be to try to get away? Y'all? It's just as ridiculous when we try to escape the creator. How ridiculous is it that we are trying to escape from ourselves? We're trying to escape God's will. Everywhere you go, there he is. But the good news is today, he says, you don't have to run away. You can turn and run to the Father. I'm so glad he allows U-turns. When you are running from God, you will head towards stormy weather. Count it. Write it down. Problem is, when we say no to God, we're on our own now. 
We don't have that anchor that's holding us safely in the harbor when the winds blow, when the trials come. And they'll come. It's life. It's a broken world. We don't want to live that way. These storms come. And when you run from God, life will always get the best of you. Instead of you getting the best that God has for what he wants to accomplish through us. Jonah paid dearly for his effort to run away from God. And he was miserable. That's putting it mildly, as you will see next week when we dive into this. He would never be joyful or satisfied again unless he comes back to the Father. Jonah ran the wrong way. In 1929, some of you were a fan of the Rose Bowl, I'm sure, like I was watching it. In 1929, there was a game between Cal and Georgia Tech. And this man right here on the left is Roy Regals, also known as Wrong Way Roy. He has the dubious honor of being the guy who saw the fumble, picked it up, and everybody was going crazy, and then he turns the wrong way and runs 75 yards toward his own end zone. Not only did the other team not know what was going on, his own team started to chase him down, running after him, going, Roy, you're going the wrong way. He's so fired up. He's going 15, 10, 5. Finally, at the one-yard line, his own teammate stops him. And the play is dead. But when you're fourth and 78 for a first down, you have no choice but to punt. The punt was in his own end zone, so there wasn't enough room. And the punt got blocked. And the block got recovered by the other team, resulting in a safety. So instead of Roy being the hero and them winning the game 7-6, to six, they now lose the game 8-7. to seven by one point. Now we think that's bad enough, but how awful is it that for the next century, books are written about it, articles are written about it, and now poor old Roy is remembered as wrong way Roy. How would you like that distinction? How would you like to be forever remembered as that guy? Wrong way Roy. Today we see wrong way Jonah. But the good news is there's another book that's written and it tells us that we can make a U-turn, that there is hope. None of us are too far gone. God offers grace and forgiveness, but you have to turn and receive that. He offers U-turns. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I've used up all my time. We're going to pick this up again next Sunday. Please come back. Invite a friend. It is going to be so awesome. So fired up about it. I'm going to invite Pastor Bill to come up now, and he is going to share with us an opportunity that we have to bless and help our upcoming mission trip. So I'll invite you back here Wednesday night. And also Sunday morning, Pastor Bill, brother, take it away. And when you're done, if you'll just, you'll dismiss us.